Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be discussing our own galaxy and the satellites of the Milky Way. But more specifically we're discussing this new study that sort of suggests our Milky Way doesn't actually have that many satellites to begin with. The galaxies we usually refer to as satellites turn out to be something a little bit different. So let's discuss this idea of satellite galaxies in a little bit more detail and talk about this recent discovery. But first of all, I guess let's start with the map and sort of the idea of what we're talking about. And I guess let's start with this image right here provided by the press release you can find in the description. This here shows us the night skies with some of the well-known dwarf galaxies that have been discovered in the last few decades. Now the famous ones here are of course the Large Magellanic Cloud and the Small Magellanic Cloud. The two neighboring galaxies you see in this simulation with the Large Magellanic Cloud being right here and the small Magellanic Cloud being very close to it. So these are the galaxies we've known about for hundreds and thousands of years, mostly because they're visible even without a telescope. You just have to be in a dark enough place. But this interesting video by Marcel Pawlowski shows us how a lot of new galaxies were discovered in the last few decades, with many of them now visible using powerful telescopes. All of these very, very tiny dwarf galaxies, for the most part, were referred to as the so-called satellite galaxies with 59 of them confirmed to be within approximately 1.4 million light years away from planet Earth. With some of them also being visible in this image right here, the Phoenix Dwarf that you can kind of see on the bottom is considered to be one of the most distant so-called satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. And naturally the Andromeda Galaxy and the Triangulum Galaxy have their own satellites as well. And as the name implies here, the idea behind satellite galaxies is that, well, they're supposed to stay around the main galaxy and to some extent possibly orbit around it. With a lot of these dwarf galaxies slowly being broken apart and sort of stretched because of the tidal interactions and the phenomenon known as the REM pressure coming from the Milky Way itself, eventually sort of being absorbed into the Milky Way and basically leaving almost nothing behind. For example, here is an image of a galaxy known as NGC 5907, where the leftovers of an ancient dwarf galaxies are clearly visible as remnants that we usually refer to as a stellar stream. The stream that sort of goes around the galaxy as this ancient dwarf galaxy orbited around it and most likely fell apart eventually being absorbed completely. And this is naturally something that we've seen around the Milky Way as well. Quite a lot of these stellar streams have been found in the past and we've talked about many of them in some of the previous videos. And one of the most famous and well-studied galaxies, dwarf galaxies, that even today orbits the Milky Way and produces the stellar stream is the galaxy known as Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. This beautiful simulation by Eugene Vasiliev, whose paper you can find in the description below, shows us how all of this formed in approximately 2.5 billion years. So this blob you see, that's the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, and the center right there is of course the Sun and the Milky Way. So eventually it produced the stream that sort of resembles something like this. This is exactly what we see in the night skies. But the thing is, of all of the dwarf galaxies we've discovered so far, of all 59 of them in the vicinity of the Milky Way, only Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy has been officially confirmed to be in orbit. But what about the other ones? Well, it's always been implied that they're also orbiting, but it's never really been officially proven. And looks like this recent study suggests that none of them are in orbit. As a matter of fact, all of them seem to be moving extremely fast, suggesting that pretty much most of them, if not all of them, are basically on their entry to the Milky Way and will very likely get completely destroyed when they come close enough. But first, what exactly happens to smaller objects, specifically smaller galaxies, when they approach a large and massive galaxy such as the Milky Way? So as I mentioned, there are two major effects. There is the tidal stripping, or the tidal effects, and there is also something referred to as the REM pressure stripping. Now, this video here is a perfect illustration for the tidal effects. Essentially, things get really, really stretched out because of the tidal interaction from the massive Milky Way galaxy and the much less massive and a lot less dense Sagittarius Dwarf. It produces the tidal strips you see right here. But what about that ram pressure? Well, that's something that happens in liquids usually, when some sort of a body moving through the liquid starts to experience a force of drag as it moves through that liquid. And when it comes to galaxies, this is usually experienced when a galaxy is moving really, really fast through some sort of a massive cloud of gas. One of the best examples of this is the galaxy known as NGC 4402, 
which is actually moving this way. And because of a really large amount of gas that is hitting somewhere right here, a lot of the gas in this galaxy is slowly escaping, creating a kind of a tail behind this galaxy that's so visible as this brown stuff you see leaking from the top right. And so normally when a massive galaxy interacts with a smaller galaxy, both ram pressure and the tidal effects are responsible for first of all stripping the smaller galaxy of everything it has on the inside and also usually stopping the production of stars and then slowly stretching it into tiny tiny strips which eventually get absorbed into the main galaxy. With Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy now undergoing the last stage, the tidal stripping. But many of these smaller dwarf galaxies, located not too far away from the Milky Way, mostly currently undergoing the ram pressure. And the scientists have discovered that a lot of these closer galaxies have officially stopped producing stars not so long ago. Whereas the ones that are still farther away, such as the Fornax or the Phoenix galaxies, are still producing stars even today. But this new study that, as always, you can find in the description below, conducted a completely new analysis using some of the data from the incredible ESA's Gaia telescope that has been very busy creating extremely accurate maps of the night sky, and specifically studying very precise motion of different stars, different galaxies, and different objects that are usually very difficult to detect. With the main point of the paper being that a lot of these dwarf galaxies are moving way, way too fast to be in orbit of the Milky Way, suggesting that none of these dwarf galaxies are orbiting the Milky Way and are instead falling into it and might orbit in the future. For now though, they are basically on their first approach. Or at least the 40 galaxies that were investigated in this study. And this also means that all of them are relatively new to this region. They most likely arrived less than 2 billion years ago. With each of these 40 dwarf galaxies having way too much energy and way too much velocity compared to, for example, the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy that was previously mentioned. Which means that none of these galaxies spent enough time around the Milky Way to be influenced by it in a lot of ways. And this of course means a lot of things. First of all, the Milky Way didn't really get a chance to influence them just yet. As they fall into the Milky Way, there's a high chance that they're going to be disrupted, they're going to be stretched, and eventually absorbed by our galaxy. But some of them might actually get captured into the orbit around the Milky Way and might stay here a little bit longer. Which ones, nobody really knows. On the other hand, because there are not a lot of galaxies orbiting around the Milky Way, it sort of implies that the Milky Way is an extremely voracious eater. It seems to absorb pretty much every dwarf galaxy that gets close to it. It doesn't really leave a lot behind. In other words, all of the previous dwarf galaxies that might have come close to the Milky Way might have just gotten absorbed and completely disappeared from existence, possibly leaving behind nothing but a typical global cluster. Since there are approximately 150 of these around the Milky Way, and possibly a few more undiscovered, it implies that, well, maybe there were approximately 100 different dwarf galaxies that were swallowed in the past. Now obviously I'm just speculating here, but it does seem kind of likely. And this also means that because of the mass of the Milky Way, it's just extremely efficient at destroying these dwarf galaxies and possibly swallowing them completely. And so possibly after one or two orbits, a typical dwarf galaxy completely falls apart and leaves almost nothing behind. Just a few stars that eventually get absorbed into the disk itself. Which of course implies that many of these, or most of these, are not technically satellite galaxies. The Milky Way simply leaves nothing behind to become a satellite. Or at least for a long enough period. And it also means that there are probably a lot more signs of these ancient dwarf galaxies that were eaten by the Milky Way, very likely all over the place. We just can't really see it just yet. Now on the other hand, the scientists also discovered that a lot of these dwarf galaxies have a little bit too much kinetic energy. They're moving with a little bit too much energy. And it's most likely caused by the ramp pressure effects from the amount of different gas and amount of different mass around the Milky Way. And so in other words, just like with NGC 4402 right here, the Milky Way has a very similar effect on all of these dwarf galaxies as they fall into the Milky Way, but it seems to have a lot more effect than originally anticipated. But then on top of this, there was another major discovery in regards to the region where most of these galaxies seem to be located, which one day might reveal their origin and of course the source of all of these dwarf galaxies, because they seem to be coming from the same region. Now, first of all, this is related to some of the older studies and another simulation by Marcel Pawlowski that suggests that many of these galaxies seem to be in a relatively similar polar region. This is usually referred to as the vast polar structure, also known as VPOS. 
Now, it's maybe not as easy to see it in this simulation, but it sort of becomes more clear if I were to show you the map as it's seen from planet Earth. The vast majority, or roughly around 50% of all dwarf galaxies, are sort of concentrated in this tiny region of the night skies around the galactic pole, with many of them forming an unusual perpendicular position around the Milky Way galaxy. So basically, if this right here is the disk of the Milky Way, a lot of these dwarf galaxies for some reason are in a somewhat unusual perpendicular location and also seem to be along a very specific region of space. But this new study also identified another structure or another region, which is sort of seen here and also here, that the scientists refer to as Sagittarius Polar Structure, SPOS. And this seems to represent about 20% of all dwarf galaxies, with a lot of them sharing the orbit with Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, or at least coming from the same region of space as Sagittarius Dwarf. And all of this is somewhat intriguing, because it kind of implies that many of these dwarf galaxies share the same origin or potentially even share some other properties, and were possibly even created from the same gas, but their true origin and of course where they're coming from is currently not really well understood. With one of the implications from the study suggesting that a lot of these dwarf galaxies, most likely coming from the same region, keep constantly feeding the Milky Way and making our galaxy grow larger and larger, something that's going to be happening for the next few billions of years. But there are obviously quite a lot of unanswered questions, such as for example their origin or how they are created to begin with. And so it looks like the Milky Way galaxy doesn't actually have any satellites except for that one I mentioned previously. Most of the other dwarf galaxies are basically its food. But this of course needs to be confirmed. For now that's all I'm going to mention. On that note, check out the study and all of the relevant links in the description below, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.